So, so we'll start by just to say uh, we might need some clicker support. Uh, but in any case, welcome. Uh, this is one of our uh, partnership uh, sessions to um, have um, exposure and get more experience in how we are working with external partners within the Wikimedia movement. It's a very open topic of the discussion, so I'm very pleased that you have given it a go to see what we're going to be talking about. And in a very general sense, it's all about leadership and uh, the very broadly understood value of openness and how do external organizations to the Wikimedia movement deal with openness. It's going to be a very high-level discussion, but in that sense, I hope it will be really interesting and thought-provoking. The panelists are from uh, quite a few different fields, um, so I hope it will give you some thoughts about um, organizations and how they deal with openness and, and even with uh, Wikimedia movement itself. I'll introduce them in a second. Uh, I'm uh, Daria Sebulska. I'm the director of programs at Wikimedia UK, where for the last 12 years I've been working on collaborations with external organizations in around openness, uh, releasing information, working with communities. In terms of our panel, I'm, I'm quite excited to introduce them all to you. Um, firstly, we have the Professor Dr. Habilitowany Andrzej Szczelski. He is the director of the National Museum in Krakow, one of key partners of Wikimedia Poland. Uh, we also have Professor Dr. Habilitowany Agnieszka Turska-Kawa, who is currently the vice chancellor of Silesian University, and also um, uh, Alicja Knast who is uh, since uh, 2021 the director of the Czech National Gallery. But we're all Polish, fun fact. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, we'll start with, uh, some of the panelists will have a brief presentation to start off with, give us a bit more context into their work. And then we'll have a discussion about leadership, openness, values, challenges of working within open. Um, hopefully there'll be time for questions from the audience. So as you listen, please think about things that you would want to ask them. Straight after this session, which will take about an hour, we'll have actually a presentation from the National Museum of Krakow to highlight a particular collaboration uh, with, uh, with openness that they've had. So I hope you actually stay on beyond the hour to, to hear in more detail how this sort of collaborations could start. Um, but I think that's all I want to say in terms of intros. And let's start with our first presentation uh, from uh, Knieszka. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me start with the university perspective as a researcher, as a, a person who is responsible for science at the University of Silesia. Um, yesterday, actually, I started to talk about trust, to talk about uh, building the trustworthy community of researchers. And uh, I mentioned that for me, science is uh, kind of two dialogues. Uh, firstly, we conducted with the, uh, uh, with the other researchers by publishing, by uh, reacting, by criticizing, by citing, and so on. And uh, of course, uh, the condition is open science because we have to have the access to all of those publications. On the other side, we have the dialogue with the society just to be, uh, just to be clear with reacting to the real problems of the society. And then, of course, open science in the condition. Today I would like to uh, add to those uh, thoughts uh, a few others. Uh, first, let's focus on the researcher community. Uh, on the one side, of course, we can perceive um, open science as a kind of support and help in those dialogues. But on the other side, for me, is a kind of prevention tool. Why? Because um, actually we work in a non-transparent uh, 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 surround. Because we have no rules about open access, we have no strict rules about uh, publishing. There are some journals, many of course journals, I can say more and more, that expect uh, publishing everything, um, like sources, like data, like uh, um, uh, databases. But on the other side, it's not the obvious rule. So there are still many journals, they don't ask you for, for this, so you can do anything and no one will ask. So, of course, it makes the space and some holes in the system just to cheat. And it is used like this by many of researchers. Um, 
what for? For example, for fake prestiges, for uh, some points in evaluation system, because we are evaluated, we are judging, um, we are sharing, uh, we are given money for this. So there are many motivation to cheat and to try to find some holes in the system. Uh, open science could be a prevention in this. And just uh, let me show a few examples, because it's not only about uh, a few retraction, it's about hundreds of retraction in, last, uh, in the last years. Um, I let's try. Okay. Um, just a few words. Francesca Gino, Harvard Business School. Uh, she was uh, one of the world's top 40 business professors under 40. Uh, let's say only four retraction in eight years. So it's, we can say it's nothing. But let's go with Harvard. Dederick Staple, Tilburg University, Netherlands. Uh, we can find 58 publications retracted so far. Uh, Nature named him as one of the 10 most cited researchers, mo uh, most influential in 2011. So it was the most active, let's say, time quota uh, for, for him. Brian Wonsink, Psychology Cornell University, United States. Um, 18 articles, uh, but he was uh, awarded with the IG Nobel Prize. It's a kind of, um, you know, similar Nobel, to, but more humoristic, but of course science. Uh, Rafael Lick, University of Cordoba, Spain, uh, one of the most cited researchers you can check. I checked it in the morning, still more than 50,000 uh, citations, so it's something in our, in our field. Uh, but in the first three months of 2023, he published 58 pa papers, articles. So someone counted uh, one every 37 hours, so it's impossible. But he did it, uh, I don't know, um, uh, Oh, okay, <laughs> he thought that no one could could find it. Uh, and Hindawi, this is uh, this is a big publishing house uh, founded in 1997, and in 90 in 2021 it was uh, it was uh, purchased by Willis and Son. Uh, a year later, it was announced that more than 500 pa papers uh, should be retracted uh, among uh, 16 journals. 14 of them this year were closed. And it was not cheating only uh, uh, among uh, authors, it was also in the process. So reviewers, editors, and many others just to, f just to find some holes in the system. So for me, open data uh, should be the common rule. Just to make our community more trustworthy for ourselves. Because I can't imagine the situation that uh, as, a researcher, uh, as a researcher I'm reading something and then I have to think if it's true or not. Then I have to check everything, find the database, check if uh, even simple correlation are okay, because it lasts forever. And it, it, it just stop, uh, stops the, the science, developing the science. On the other side, uh, re regarding those dialogue that we conduct with the society, uh, we have more, we have observed um, increase of skepticism in science during last years. And of course, uh, it, is, uh, it has multi-level fundament. It's not only about uh, not trustworthy community of researchers, but also many others, uh, many other fields. Uh, I think that we can discuss it later. But um, for us, is it it, this is important that we have to be the authority. And each information we put forth into the world should be reliable and, uh, and trustworthy. Um, during last years, we have observed the result of uh, negative result of this uh, in increasing of conspiracy, the amount of in co conspiracy theories, believers, um, fake news, fake profiles, uh, propaganda, and many other uh, negative um, uh, phenomenon that, uh, of course, they existed before, but not at the, that large scale as we can observe it now. So. Um, I think that uh, it doesn't, I think that it will increase if we want uh, put focus and attention how to stop it, how to build trust, how to regain trust, because I think this is also about regaining trust. And for me as a researcher and as a civil servant, I think, um, 
it is still unbelievable that we have some problems during pandemic that uh, the minister the minister have problems with persuading people to uh, to be vaccinated or to vaccinate their children not only uh, on covid but at the same time we have more and more people who believe in uh, the flat earth or in the heroism of putin so uh, this is the aim for all of us not only for researchers but for the civil society how to prevent it and i am pretty sure that uh, open science idea is very helpful uh, in this project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we'll get to some of those topics later uh, in the discussion. Already an interesting uh, theme of kind of the openness as a way of um, dismantling various powers and of building trust at the same time. Um, our next presentation will be a spin on this topic in a, in a very interesting angle. So I'll pass on to, um, to Alicia to hear about her introductory presentation. Hi, uh, first of all, big thank you to all Vicky community. We are really your, um, we really owe you a lot in the museums and galleries sector. Uh, we really, um, we don't uh, pay, we don't thank you enough for what you do to us, especially by um, providing uh, visual content so we can we can really work with it or we can uh, distribute what we've got in our collections in a bit much better way than our own tools. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that um, uh, National Gallery in Prague is an institution, um, a very old institution, established in towards the end of the 18th century from the um, spirit of giving, of sharing with uh, those who don't have access to art um, by the private society who decided just to collect uh, excellent pieces and then, and then make it public. And then uh, the idea was uh, expanded um, in... Um, in the first Czechoslovak Republic when the state decided to be a very good messenate and uh, went shopping to Prague uh, to Paris and bought, purchased from first hand from the artist excellent collection of French uh, French artists so we are it's not very well known but uh, we have uh, excellent pieces uh, by Gauguin and Picasso which are really the in the Renoir we say, we are key pieces in uh, in uh, the uh, those artists uh, portfolio um, so that is a, more or less about the gallery. We have um, five collections uh, and six buildings, and one of them is Valtergny Palace. It's a first rate palace with big, big, big holes, uh, very monumental and very um, pretty and with very nice light, which is really encouraging people to really do a lot on social media. And um, at, and, uh, and we don't, of course, stop it because we feel that uh, that's a full, full right of the public just to use the space. And sometimes we use the space as well to to show certain uh, certain uh, pieces of art uh, for free without ticket. So we did in this uh, particular case. But uh, unfortunately, it can get abused. What, what do you see? Maybe you can have it on the loop and I will talk. Uh, I will have it on the loop and uh, you can you can talk. Um, back, back. I think it's the other button. The other button. Okay. You were right. Uh, so I will do this. So it will. Sorry. You will, so you can you can pay attention to those thirty seconds uh, more. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You think it will be play? It will play. Uh, the thing is that uh, the lady says in Czech, uh, "Do you understand at all the contemporary art?" And uh, then she sits down, and in the background there is an art piece based tapestry by one of the Czech contemporary artists who actually came uh, straight from Brussels when we were exhibiting in in uh, Council of Europe, where because the Czech Republic was the, uh, was having a presidency. So, uh, so the lady decides to, and informs that it's much, much, much better really to get more data from the Vodafone and really go and see the White Lotus uh, movie um, because that's more interesting than that. So on, there is, on three levels, there is abuse. First of all, of course, we were not informed about this influencer coming. The third, 
uh, there was a, a abuse of the usage without agreement of the artist who is in the background and third the actual lady the, the influencer made herself really um, in look as, as a really not very very serious uh, person and really um, kind of lowering down her own kind of persona in this uh, in this particular movie and then the entire Vodafone corporation kind of not only um, agreed to do this uh, this particular clip and and have it on the wiki on, on the Vodafone uh, channel but um, there was uh, some time since uh, since really we've got uh, you know certain communication at the very very beginning they were very um, they didn't apologize, uh, but uh, they were very uh, kind of very broad, and they've sent us long letters because, of course, we wanted to it to be explained, and we felt very bad for the artists themselves, which, leaving aside abusing the right uh, of the institution, just to know that this is used for a commercial gain. So it took some time just to get to this to, to discuss. It turned out that the people who actually were part of it were very sorry uh, that they felt that uh, they, they the brief was really wrong, and uh, that they should not do that. So, I mean, there is a positive example. So I would probably uh, I need to to say that so we did yes that was taken down, but this one was not taken down. And maybe you can even still see it. Um, is um, this is how it looked like later when we did the campaign with the Vodafone and the campaign was about really what the young people really are solving themselves which is the, the uh, intellectual property, sexuality, di diversity as well as the, uh, the accessibility. So we did this 30 second um, movie which, uh, which cost us something like one work, uh, one week work, probably two two big trucks of, of, of equipment which we cannot afford ourselves in the gallery just to get this type of crew to shoot things in our in our institution but uh, but it happened and then the result of it was really a million followers against you know 10,000 11,000 of followers for our own feeds so out of all this misery of all this kind of negligence disrespect um, kind of worry and anger and um, all the worst things you can imagine. Then we we came out, all of us, them and us, with a very kind of uh, nice feeling that, well, we can make mistakes, but then we can also good, do good things. So uh, in this particular term, uh, in this particular situation, I would say I, I trust, I have a big trust that when we find a pro kind of platform to talk, then even obviously mistaken um, steps, obviously bad solutions, obviously wrong things can turn out very good as long as we we kind of refuse uh, to be hurt. Uh, we refuse to be hurt as a gallery we just, and artists themselves also refuse to to be hurt because there is a one component of it. Uh, the influencer was asked to pay to the artists uh, and then the artists were really that is financially completely different level, refused to take the money from the influencer. That's probably the, the, the biggest story. So everyone was a winner, uh, and but it took us some emotions, some time, some work, a lot of online calls to fix it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And that's um, another story of, I guess, um, of openness, but maybe what happens when we have openness without uh, respect. And actually interesting that you also reference trust. Maybe we, we go back to that in the discussion. Um, before we properly get into a conversation, I wanted to give space uh, to Dr. Szczerski to maybe also make some uh, remarks uh, in the introduction, if you wish. Um, we talked earlier about um pff, elitism and maybe a certain hierarchy in the general setup of cultural institutions and um how that plays out with openness and maybe societal access what is the role of museums in the current world in the context of of openness and of somebody who is leading such an institution thank you thank you very much for the invitation no presentation. The presentation will follow in the next pan part of the panel with uh, my my team here presenting uh, a particular project that we did with Wikipedia as a museum. 
a museum is a, is a very broad term, uh, so I'd like to focus on particular type of museum, such as ours. Uh, this is the largest museum in Poland, established in late 19th century, when Poland was still under partitions. It was always a symbol of, of Polish national identity. It always collected the best and the most representative artworks. Um, it grew in time to include the masterpieces, uh, not only of Polish art, but also of uh, European art, such as Leonardo da Vinci, Lady with an Ermine, and the Czartoryski collection. So it's a, it's basically a symbol. It's not just an institution. It's a symbol of a, of a particular cultural setup that uh, is associated with museums as uh, um, tokens uh, or symbols of hierarchy, um, canon, things like that. So when you when you do when you work in institutions like that. Uh, you have to be aware of this of this uh, cultural heritage, and you have to understand uh, that you. And I think it's kind of interesting in in today's context. You have to take the role of a reference point. You have to be a a, a, a place where people would go to um, to good to ask for what well, I think what the first panelist said for the reference for for something that you can rely on that something that's definitely sure and unshakable. And it's a very difficult position, I have to say, today. Uh, so to work with this uh, is, I think, it re regards a great courage, um, uh, authority, integrity, um, but also, and that's the point, openness. Mm, because in contrast to what you think about places like this, if they have to function in the contemporary world, they have to be as open as possible. And I think through Wikipedia, we are trying to achieve that. We are trying to spread the, the, no the knowledge um, about about these reference points, if you like, or canon, if you like, through the new media, um, and I think this is what what is what is the uh, absolutely crucial phenomenon in our case. So to enter into the Wikipedia project was a milestone in the way that we diffuse the knowledge, uh, especially to the digital uh, digital resources. We have our own digital uh, base uh, databases. Uh, we have digitalized artworks, uh, documents, prints from our collection, over 140,000 uh, pieces already available online. But through Wikipedia, we are able to diffuse them much more broadly. Um, in particular cases, this is a ten, tenfold uh, increase in the, in the references uh, in the web. Uh, so it, it's, an, it's an incredible uh, uh, scale uh, of, of diffusing the knowledge. In the same time, we are still talking about the uh, particular artworks from our collection of and great names from the from the history of Polish art, which we kind of are not ashamed of saying that they, they are the key figures and the artworks are the masterpieces. But if you look at them from the perspective, for instance, of interaction with Wikipedia creators, this is what makes them important today. Okay, so the, the point is that the openness in today's museum is um, especially important for those museums who are established, such as ours, as the canonical institutions. There are other um, tons of museums that work in a different way, that are more so socially interacted, they are more politically orientated, they are more experimental uh, from right from the beginning. But there are other museums like ours that are based on a different on a different pattern. So that's why the openness is so important. In fact, uh, you, you rightly mentioned the idea of elitism that surrounds the, the museums, which, especially such as ours, which is a completely false uh, stereotype, because what we are looking for is exactly the opposite. We are looking for not be elitist. We are, we are trying to uh, diffuse our, our knowledge, our expertise, to as broad as possible uh, networks of, of people. You will see in a minute uh, how it worked with... Uh, a kind of figure that in Polish history stands for something uh, so obvious that it's almost in invisible, an artist of late 19th century that uh, is regarded as uh, one of the greatest artists in Polish history. But as you know, usually the greatest artists are sometimes not the most interesting artists for today's public. Well, so what was the key is was to make him interesting for the contemporary, especially young young uh, pu public, but not only. And I think through Wikipedia we were able to, to, to do this. So if I want to make a kind of a general a general statement is that um, uh, Wikipedia can also be, uh, in, in case of co collaborating with institutions like ours, 
a place that definitely becomes a reference point. Okay, that uh, and it's it's surely based on a great expertise, enormous resources which are given for free uh, to the to the Wikipedia community and to the to the users who are given for free. And this is the the, the point that they uh, become uh, easily acceptable uh, accessible um, knowledge expertise that helps you to build the, the, the knowledge which needs to be there as a, as a reference point. Um, we are, interestingly enough, the only museum in Poland of that grandeur and scale that entered into Wikipedia. Normally you would think that this is a place for the small institutions to experiment with. No, we are trying to show that these huge canonical institutions have to do this and they know how to do it. So uh, we know that there are other museums in Poland that will follow uh, our our path, and we're very happy uh, to to find out. We are currently developing new projects for Wikipedia with uh, even more resources that are digitalized that are available from us. So this is an, an ongoing and growing project because we see the results of it. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, introductory uh, presentations. Like I said, no promises. I'm not sure we're going to have time for questions, depending how our conversation goes. But if we do start thinking about how you would want to interrogate our panel. Um, but for now, I want to go deeper into actually what we were just talking about, um, the different cultures of like a science and cultural world and how we do things in the Wikimedia movement. For us, I would say it's obvious that we are activists, that we're changing, shifting how things are done. Um, but I think it's useful for us to think about the other side and how this looks like from the perspective of established uh, big canonical organizations and, and academia and what it's like as a leader to be pushing against how things are generally done. Um, so I'm curious, we, we talked about quite a few values connected with openness, like um, the, the respect, trust, elitism. Um, so as leaders, how do you kind of model the values that are needed for openness? How do you shape a culture of openness? It can be difficult, exposing. I think it requires tolerance to uncertainty um, and a, a skill of moderating anxieties, connected fears about openness from uh, the environment within which you're you're working. So I'd like to start with talking about how you model openness values. Um, what's tricky, what's inspiring about it. I, th I think it would be interesting to hear from, from all of you. Okay, I, I think that to, to your list of uh, values, I would add uh, just openness. Because this is the most important value and I think we all fight for this to open all our works. And it is also the same with our publications, yes, like papers or books. Um, how we can shape the model? I think that in my case, in academia, uh, leadership is much more important than our, than our positions. Because, uh, as I said at the beginning, we can't force anyone to publish in, uh, in open access. We can't force anyone actually to publish. Uh, so it's a different uh, way. But um, we can only encourage. We can only use some soft uh, tools. So leadership is very important. Because if someone say, says, okay, I don't want to publish in open access, I have some friends, they can um, share it, so on, I can do nothing. I can do nothing. So uh, we are trying to, to encourage, we are trying, trying to persuade people. How? Of course, mainly by our own uh, authorities. So uh, I have to be the authority for others, uh, showing that uh, it is worth to publish in open access, uh, showing that uh, following this we can connect with others abroad, with good uh, researchers. Uh, following this we get, uh, we are given some projects, so we are given some money to spend on other pu publications. You have to know that open access is very expensive. 
Usually, average it is about uh, 3,000 euros, even more sometimes in better journals, especially in hard sciences. So it's not easy to, to, to publish like this, but of course there are open science journals and then you don't have to pay. So by our own experience showing this, uh, for me, when I became a director of uh, the Institute of Political Science, I decided to make our internal um, system of awards. So I tried to um, to 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 show people that uh, you can you can be given more points, you can be given more uh, money for your own research if you publish in good journals. So at the beginning, it was a big fight for this uh, because how you can do it, uh, you have no right. But at the end, it turned out that almost all of my colleagues decided that it is worth this. So following each of good, valuable publications, uh, they found, they found uh, many good projects, they found uh, good connections, relationships, and it was, uh, well, something um, additional and uh, they decided to follow to follow this way and i think that today they can say okay after a few years we can uh, we can decide that this is this is the direction but it's not the it's not the common space for us uh, uh, what was more important for one of the most important thing for me uh, inter mentoring because of course we have some people who believe in open science and we have others who say who would say that okay if i publish something in the in internet especially out of journals like a preprint uh, it could be stolen someone could take my idea we have still some uh, a way of thinking like this. So then we can try to create some uh, teams uh, sharing those experiences and then people were trying to persuade themselves that it is worth uh, to, to, uh, to use open science as a tool. So in our case in academia, leadership is very important, your own experience and uh, creating teams because uh, relationships, uh, our own authorities and also our colleagues' authorities are uh, extremely important. Thank you. Uh, I really don't know what to say about that because we don't read, uh, we don't write articles. Uh, what we do, we open to the public our visual content. So we, of course, in the National Gallery, we have a ex an expert who really li is liaising with artists and convincing them just to give us the rights just to publish things. But uh, the gallery is uh, the visual content as well as the space. So I would like to share with you one, um, I think, positive as well example of how sometimes the uh, kind of painful uh, painful discussion have to take place and then there is only uh, only the good uh, result out of it. We did open an exhibition called um, uh, uh, not, not a single feeling it lasts forever. Uh, which is uh, based on the Solidarity Collection from Skopje. Skopje was in six, 1964 um, uh, affected by the earthquake and then the entire world was sending the art pieces to Skopje to build a new collection, in including uh, um, Czechoslovak artists and institutions. So we, we've got back this uh, collection to our, in our uh, gallery because we really, after the, the war in Ukraine, we decided not necessarily, of course, support the Ukraine effort, but also say, well, we have to really look uh, in the past and see what solidarity today means. For me, as a Pole, the word solidarity is absolutely secret. Uh, and uh, for my colleagues in Czech Republic, um, probably not to that extent, but I remember myself once said that we should really um, follow that path and they immediately understood and saw the exhibition. We were opening it and there was a beautiful day of the grand opening in the same space as you saw the influencer sitting and shooting. And uh, suddenly on the stage there was um, something like 12 people um, uh, in black t-shirts with the uh, the mouths crossed with the red tape, red tape um, with kind of guerrilla action in, 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 in disturbing the or uh, making a making a, a their own um, statement regard, regarding the free Gaza. So. Of course, we were paralyzed because we wanted to be the peaceful ma peacemakers people. We wanted to do it in a in a, in our way, the institutional way, you know, the the way where which is actually uh, inducing reflection, uh, self reflection, and reflection in the, then in society. And then we've got this guerrilla thing. 
Uh, it was after, maybe you remember, on Charles University, there was a shooting when a single shooter uh, shot uh, like something like 11 people and some of them were in badly injured. So entire Czech Republic and we were really, we are deeply, deeply, deeply wounded and in fear of things happening on that way. So my security guys immediately went to the stage and began to take those guys down. Uh, because they were afraid about that maybe there's something like that. So who is to judge? When what is going on? Is there is it the crazy shooter or some crazy things or you know the security people? They they don't have the you know political science professorship in. They don't need to understand the entire world was going on. So they were doing their job, but so, so suddenly I said to them, just stop it. Don't do it anymore. So we felt all of us we were wounded again. The curator, the collaborators, the the poor uh, security guys who were uh, then filmed and then they were in social media, what they do there, they did their job. You can you can see, you can put three guys in National Gallery, you will know what I mean. All of wounded. Uh, there was a leaflets from, from the balconies and just that the gallery is not really um, making stands uh, uh, for this. So I wounded. Uh, so then there was another uh, event. We knew that the same guerrilla group will come and then will ask for the space again, just to be given. And then we we asked to to clear with us, so we will know we will know how to react. We we are not against the content, but the form. They didn't. They didn't. They they refused to do that. We were very much afraid. But since we did before uh, voice that we are really hurt and we are really wounded. What they did, they was, there was really something very, very beautiful. They just did a performance which uh, was uh, not the kind of shouting, interrupting, but they took an olive tree and they do, just took it from the entrance. They brought it to the exhibition space and they left it there without watering. So that was a, a big symbol of, of, of about that. They concern about what is going on in, in Palestine and, and uh, in Gaza Strip and that the kind of agriculture, because the exhibition was about agriculture and what we owe to agriculture, that this is really a big, a big thing. So I, there was a one moment I need to share with you. There was one moment where my eyes crossed with the eyes of the main leader of that group. I, I will never forget that. She knew what she, she, she discussed, I mean, she, that I'm on her side or we are on her side for we want, you know, genocide not to happen. But that's the way to do it. And I am absolutely happy that we did not um, criticize them for the first guerrilla action. But we took the time just to learn both of our, both, both sides, just to give the space to for an uh, opinion. And of course, you might ask, um, what is in those canonical institutions do activists, to what extent activists do have the right to say things? That's my main point, because uh, the word activism appears here. It rarely appears in historical institutions, but it does appear in art institutions and have to. It must appear in art institutions. It's, there is no way back. I mean, we have to uh, be uh, prepared for it um, uh, from the leadership point of view, but the entire team. I mean, it's not about the director of the institution. It's about really the entire team, the security guys, having empathy, and, and but of course not crossing the law. That's always my point. So the openness of space, the content, sharing the content, sharing the message is something which uh, will have its own challenges today. And they will be like date on day-to-day -day basis. And there is no way we can have a handout to give it to, to prepare for ourselves or give it to our teams. So I don't know, empathy <laughs> is the only thing. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's I think it's important for us to remember, uh, at least from my perspective, and I hope for a lot of others, like I see Wikimedians as activists and a lot of spaces can be activists, but it plays out in such intricate and challenging ways as as leaders. So thank you for giving us a bit more color in through those examples. Before I move on to a lighter topic like COVID and the pandemic, um, I wanted to hear any reactions from, from you about this general context of yeah, leadership, leading values and managing those various uh, tensions that we are called for when we work with openness. I'll be very brief, uh, uh, just to, to let the next subject appear. Uh, I'd like to say two things. Uh, first of all, um, 
when you are leader of a big institution, you you have a lot of possibilities in hand and a lot of proposals coming from outside, and you have to uh, create the the space within the institution to speak freely about it, discuss it, and then to make a, a make a choice. And I think this is what happened with Wikipedia, that we understood that from many many options that we have, this one this one is especially important. Uh, because of the obvious uh, things that I said in the beginning. But what was key, I think, is, is that you as a leader is, are able to, to give out, give up some of your authority and give it to the, to the people who work in the, in the institution. Because we have no control of what is being said on Wikipedia. I mean, I don't supervise it at all. It's done through, through, through the team, uh, through the Wiki residents. And I think this is fantastic because this is the moment when you when you realize that this is um, a different type of uh, diffusing the knowledge. And uh, yes, you agree as a leader to do this, but in the same time, you agree to give up and lose, not lose really, to win something, because you give up some of your authority and you give it to, to people in the institution. So I think this is the first thing I want to say. And the secondly, as a, as a leader, I think, uh, I think Alicia said that uh, clearly, that you need to build a common ground, you need to build a common space. You need to, uh, you need to use the institution. You need to its openness, not to uh, not to build walls between people, and not to enhance the the, the controversial opinions in a, in a bad way, uh, but precisely to 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 create a space for the debate and discussion. I think this this is a type of openness that I really appreciate. Openness that it's not making people to stand against each other. But to create a common ground for for the discussion, I think Wikipedia is also a fantastic tool for this because this this um, basically knowledge is freedom, as I would say, and and through distribution of knowledge, you give people freedom, you give space to think, you give people uh, a power to discuss things. But you also, precisely as a leader, you create the, the space for this. It, it just will not happen just like that. You have to you have to work on that. Thanks. But but the giving up of, of power as leaders can be can be difficult, stressful. It's a risk, and I think it's really important for us as Wikimedians to remember what people are giving up and risking in collaborating with our movement, um, especially. Of course, as individuals, but also as representatives of institutions where you have a, a different type of responsibility. Um, the the time of COVID, I think it's important as much as maybe we uh, have moved on from it because it was a time of stress testing and risking and experimenting a lot in, in various institutions and it played out differently uh, in what things it made easier opened up or more difficult for institutions and and for that reason as we move towards the end of our discussion i thought it would be interesting to interrogate our panel in how covid played out in their institutions and what it meant for openness maybe we can extrapolate somehow in like what it means for how we collaborate in the future so um i'm, I'm interested to hear about your experiences from the time of covid what did it change okay um so firstly, as the university, yes. <laughs> uh, so there were many challenges because we had to put into the internet in one day all the teaching stuff and it was difficult, especially for, uh, the, of course, we have some um, um, researchers, lecturers who hardly use the internet and some tools, of course, we had to buy something at the beginning, uh, uh, taught people how to use them. So it was very extensive, it was a challenge um, and it didn't work at the beginning as it should, but with the time it was better and better and now we use it uh, and we appreciate those tools. So, of course, uh, it was something new and we had to uh, learn how to how to use it but but we did it and finally uh, we succeed but um, if I can say, uh, probably it won't be a very popular opinion, as a researcher, as an individu in individual researcher, actually it was a great time for me. Because I was sitting at home, I had time for working, I could sit on my, uh, on my papers, I didn't have to spend and sometimes waste time on traveling, uh, on going to my office, I, I could do everything in front of, in, in my office at home. So uh, I don't remember any other time when I spent so much time um, being focused on my research. 
And of course, following this, uh, uh, there, were, there are many publications, that's why uh, I, I'm proud of them. Of course, there were some um, obvious disadvantages, um, like missing parents, missing families, of course, I know, but I, I, that opinion was only as a professional and in connection to my professional, professional field. Uh, and um, one more advantage, um, this was a new situation and uh, firstly pandemic in one day actually shaken the sense, the basic sense of security uh, on, in all fundamental um, levels, yeah, I mean economic, psychological, social and many professional and many, many others, so it generated uh, many new fields of research. Because, uh, well, I, I work in political psychology, so for me it is interesting why people behave this and that way. And I observed that there were new ground for us to, to research, to, to, to check, to explore. So it was, uh, for a researcher, it was very, very interesting. Of course, uh, taking into account all these advantages, I have to, uh, I, I can't say that it was a great time, but this was, uh, this was some kind of advantages of, of that time. And uh, of course, um, uh, Today we, we are looking into the time, trying to compare and trying to, to look at the time more rationally, let's say. Um, but uh, we have many valuable value publications and I think that um, um, for researchers it was something new that could open our minds in a, in a, new, situ in a new situation. And I have to admit that it showed us that internet is needed, that open science is needed, and uh, uh, there were also many preprints in the internet. So it was something new that people decided to uh, publish only their ideas at the beginning, just to, let's say, uh, say, okay, this is mine and I'm starting to work on it and in a year you can, uh, you can expect, uh, expect the, 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 the whole paper. But uh, we tried to, to, to make some ideas and to connect them uh, in, in the internet. Thank you. We decided it's my turn now. Uh, and I, uh, yes, uh, uh, what I want to say is that uh, on the one hand that's true that the COVID uh, period gave us a sense of um, the un unnecessary hyperactivism that we all do. I think this is what was, uh, we had to really concentrate the resources on something that was really important and because we, we couldn't meet all the time, there was no interaction in the team, so uh, we only could do things that were really, really important. Um, so that's, that's the first thing that I realized. Secondly, I think the COVID was absolutely a, a, a milestone in in moving the museum activities to the web uh, into the web i think it's, it's a definite thing that happened and will not return to the previous uh, levels so the amount of knowledge distributed through you know, the internet the different forms of act of uh, presence in the web uh, different different um, formats also used through the social media but also to our own channels i think this was fantastic absolutely and I think this is a great uh, achievement of of uh, of this period that we we managed to to develop all those tools and they will stay uh, forever. Uh, in the same time, it gave us the feeling how important the public is for us, uh, not just the virtual public, but the, the the real existing public that people work to to create communities uh, that are physically meeting, and also to such an extent the the uh, the physicality the the the. the Presence of an artwork is something uh, that cannot be cannot be uh, replaced by the presence on the web. In the same time, we also saw how much the web can offer uh, as a tool to to discover things on the artwork that are um, inaccessible in the gallery space. So the idea of the conservation techniques, the technicalities of the object, the history. Uh, that's something that really, really um, uh, changed the uh, the course of the museum activities. I think forever, and I think in this respect, uh, the COVID, with all all the dramatism it brought, um, in case of of uh, this particular type of of museum activities, was a uh, was a turning point, um, and will be remembered for that too. I would, we decided just uh, Andre Starzl and I would f complete the uh, museum galleries part. Uh, yes, we be, yeah, I confirm. Uh, we really um, out appreciate our visitors 
first. Second, we really appreciate ourselves as teams. We enjoy meeting together now as, as teams because we had to find solutions more than um, previous times. And uh, also the content we produced back then. I mean, we are not that fortunate at the National Museum in Krakow, which is I would say always was, is, and probably will be a leader in Poland in terms of digitization of the collection. Um, and uh, we are not, I mean, National Gala Prague is not even in in halfway uh, to, to have the, uh, the collection online. But we managed to really to provide a quality online content and and within Czech um, public, uh, we've got a lot of energy back because people really were extremely grateful for our attempt to to, to share with, with the public. So we learn about uh, other regions, then uh, Czech Republic is Prago-centric. So we learned uh, that we have to cut, cater for people who live uh, in other other regions of the, of the country. And uh, COVID made it so uh, as aware about those needs which are there. Uh, definitely, it's not. It was not a good experience, but all, all in all, I think uh, the institutions went out stronger. This type of institutions went uh, is stronger after COVID. So it was a time of shift in a lot of ways. I guess the lesson for us is to harness such moments. We can be quite nimble and flexible. So this uh, moment of opening of minds, changing behaviors, concentration of resources or or a newfound appreciation for, for colleagues is something that um, I think we can um, jump on and use for, for Wikimedia. Um, and it's with this theme of collaboration and cooperation with each other, harnessing each other's uh, resources and um, approaches that I want to slowly draw us to a close. Um, just a reminder, straight after this panel, we'll have a presentation uh, to like dig deeper into the uh, Krakow National Museum's um, projects. I hope a lot of you stay uh, to hear in more detail. But just to uh, finish. We are all from different sectors and different approaches um, and the conference is called Collaboration of the Open. So um, question how we should foster openness towards each other. How can we collaborate between disciplines if it's possible? It's just I guess a few thoughts about how you would think about um, perhaps collaborating across disciplines of or with each other. Uh, all alternatively think also about what we should do as Wikimedians to assist and foster with this collaboration. Any thoughts about uh, leadership and uh, supporting working across different worlds uh, in two sentences as we finish this session? Two sentences, okay. Um, I think we have to call. It's not like the question about how, um, if or or not. We have to co cooperate. And actually, at the beginning, I was surprised that so we are from different disciplines and we are in the same panel. But now I'm pretty sure that we have to cooperate, and there is a big space for for us uh, because we have the same aims. And uh, art and science should serve the society. So uh, following those aims, uh, uh, for sure, we will find some space. Um, just one thought, uh, university is open for, for art. So we have the Department of Art. We have people who, who are painters, who are sculptors. So uh, there is a big space for this. Uh, we have... Um, mm, uh, we are organizing some seminars that we could be invited together and discuss some discuss something. So I, I have many ideas in my in my mind now that could be discussed later. But for sure, yes, and it is expected, not only needed. Two sentences is difficult, but yes. ap applied for grants, applied together for grants. Uh, the humanities uh, with uh, science really have a lot in common. It's right and left hemisphere. With whenever this, I mean, I, my experience is the the biggest uh, uh, hardcore scientist uh, uh, the person is, the more uh, the more uh, creative the person is. I mean, more understands art. I mean, I'm sorry to if I if I say something which sounds banal to you, but. Uh, in National Gallery Prague, we we did apply for something with University of Silesia, and we did not get a grant. But I'm go I'm going working on it, so I will with yeah. m with uh, 
uh, Mr. Krzykowski. Uh, but uh, we will, uh, we are uh, collaborating with Academy of Science in, in Czech Republic, with Czech University, because the grants are, you know, of course, the projects which we really can concentrate not only to talk but do. Well, collaboration is the is the key uh, factor in developing the structures of, of museum in the future. But what I want to add to what was what has been said is that um, I I believe in a, in a meaningful and uh, cooperation, not just to cooperate but to achieve a particular particular goals. I think this mm -hmm. is this is what what's necessary because it's a, it's an easy approach on the one hand. Uh, collaborate is always good, but you have to know what you want to achieve and with whom you want to work and what is the aim of the cooperation. I think we learned it through the support for the U for the Ukraine refugees, how much and how, how necessary it was to work with unexpected institutions that they wouldn't ever come across our doors, but we could help them in, a, in different ways and we realized that if there is an aim that we want to achieve, we go for it, right? So, uh, so this collaboration let it be meaningful and focused and have a concrete pro project and result. Mm. So it's about uh, like thinking and thinking openly uh, outside of our boxes, but also doing and ideally with support of resources, um, which always helps, I guess, with collaboration. So I hope um, we'll continue as Wikimedians to uh, engage with projects and, and grants that will uh, foster collaboration between our different worlds. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank our panel. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and uh, reflections about openness and collaboration. Thank you. I hope this was uh, interesting and thought-provoking for you. And to continue this thought provocation, like I said, uh, you can now uh, stay, I think, in uh, just a few minutes at 12, I think, or imminently. Right now, uh, we'll have a we'll have a, a presentation about a case study of one of the collaborations. Thank you.